Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Learning Garden Presents, Planning and Growing a Botanical Dye Garden. My name is Allison Arnold. I'm the Agriculture Extension Agent here in Buncombe County, and I'll be your host today. Our speakers today, Joyce Tromba and Pat Strang, are Extension Master Gardeners here in Buncombe County. They are working to establish our own dye garden in the learning garden here at the office at 49 Mount Carmel Road. Today they will provide a general overview of how to plan and grow a botanical dye garden, addressing plant selection, getting plants started, seed saving, garden design, maintenance, when and how to harvest dye plants. Take it away Pat and Joyce. Hi everybody. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited to share this information with you, and we're so excited that we're going to have a dye garden at the Learning Garden. So just a little bit about me. I'm a relatively new master gardener. I'm going into my third year. I've been dyeing with natural dyes, botanical dyes, for about 10 years. I began that journey when I was living overseas in an apartment in Copenhagen. I didn't have my own garden. But when I moved here to Asheville, I started planting some natural dye plants. I started with matter and weld. We'll be talking about those later. And I didn't include indigo until very recently because I thought it would be very difficult to extract the pigment from indigo or use it in its fresh form. But I've since learned about how to use it either fresh or extracting the pigment. So now, I grow all three of those, which we consider sort of the heritage colors. Almost any color can be made with those three and the addition of yellow. We'll be talking a lot about that and yellow you can get from just about anything. I'm super excited to share my knowledge with you and um, we'll be talking later about what we'll be doing out at the dye garden throughout the summer. Thanks. Hi, I'm Pat Strang and I'm the counterpart. I've been a master gardener for Ooh, 13 years, I guess. Half of that back in Fairfax County, Virginia, and the rest of the time here, seven years here now. I'm new to the botanical dyeing process. You know, I realized that I've been growing dye plants all along and wasn't even aware of it. I'd never heard of matter weld or, well, I knew indigo, but I had no idea what matter or weld were. So Joyce introduced me to those. I do have both of those growing right now. And I tried indigo last year, was not so successful, but I will give it a try again. So relatively new to the dyeing process, but not so new to the growing process. So when you're choosing plants for a dye garden, it's similar to just choosing plants for any garden, really. For those of you who are experienced gardeners, this is just going to be a no-brainer. If you're growing these specific colors, you're obviously going to want to pick the plants that give you those colors. And in the handout, we did give you a list. This is not a complete list by any means, but we gave you a list of some of the most common ones. And we did have a column there that shows you the colors that you will get from those. Those are basic colors because they will vary based on how you mordant whatever you're going to dye. And that's for another class, but you can change the color a little bit by using what we call mordants. How well does it grow in our area? You don't want to plant something that isn't going to grow well here. So you have to take that in consideration as well. And what's the life cycle? Is it an annual, biennial, or perennial? A lot of these plants are perennials, but we certainly get a lot of annuals. Again, on the plant list that we gave you, we've told you what the life cycle is. If there are any special growing requirements, we tried to give you some little hints in the handout as well. Matters one that comes to mind all the time. You use the root for the pigment. You have to let it grow for two to three years. So there's a good example of special growing requirements. And the yield, how much do you need? Depending on what you want to dye, you'll see some of the things on our handout. You need a lot of plants just to dye 100 gram of fiber. So if you don't have to use it fresh, there's ways to save it or freeze it or do things with it until you have enough uh, of the material to dye whatever you're going to dye. So yarn, we can probably th figure a skein is what 100 grams would equate to. As far as fabric goes, depending on the fabric that you're dyeing, you can get it in very different, different weights. So if it's something that's very light, you'll be able to dye more material. If it's something heavy like canvas, cotton canvas, it's going to be a little bit different. So you kind of have to figure that out. 
and then the appearance of the plant. So a lot of these plants are very beautiful, some of them not so much, and we're going to show you some pictures. Each of them is unique, and so I've learned to love even the ugly plants. So just have a look at this slide. These are all yarns that I have dyed with plants that I have grown or foraged. Of course, you can also buy dried pigments and dye stuffs from dye suppliers, but everything in this photograph I have dyed with things I've grown or foraged. So you really can get an amazing rainbow of colors. Uh, a lot of people think natural dye probably looks like that skein of yarn in the middle. It's kind of some version of beige, but it's amazing what you can get. I will say the pink on the right side was dyed with a lichen that I foraged in the woods around here. Did you want to run through what each of these are? Okay, sure. Starting on the right-hand side, that was dyed with a lichen. That was dyed with onion skin, possibly with a modifier. The next one was indigo. The next one, which is green, talk about it later, but it's really hard to get a true green from one plant. So that was dyed with some kind of yellow and then over dyed with indigo. The next one was dyed with hops. So not only can you brew beer, but you can get a nice yellow with hops. The next one was, I don't really remember, but I think that was probably dyed with a mushroom, believe, which is actually edible. That's the one where if you press the underside of the mushroom, you get a blue dye coming out and it gives you that color. The next one was dyed with matter. The next one was probably also dyed with hops. And maybe the next two, because the one after that was probably modified with some iron. The pink again was lichen. So you can see even with one dye plant, you can get a variety of shades. The initial bath will be quite strong and you can keep using it as it gets more exhausted and get the lighter colors. And the last one there was also a mushroom dye with an iron modifier. I'm going to just go through plants by color because as a fiber artist, that's how I decide what I'm going to grow. So yellow, I'll talk about the pigment, it comes from flavonoids. Flavonoids are ubiquitous. Almost anything will give you yellow. Not everything will give you a yellow that will stay on your fiber, but so many plants will give you yellow. So many plants will give you yellow, but here's some that I recommend. Weld is probably the queen of yellow. It gives you a beautiful clear yellow. That's what this yarn was dyed with. And especially if you want to mix colors or over dye, you want a very clear yellow. And this is what Well gives you. It's almost like a highlighter yellow. You can't quite believe you get that color from a green plant. Goldenrod, which you may consider something you don't want to grow in your garden, but you can certainly forage for it. It grows all over the place here in Western North Carolina. I like it, so I grow it in my garden. Dyer's Chamomile, a nice little flower that's kind of pretty. It's not very showy, but it's a nice flower. Also gives you a nice yellow. And here's some pictures. The one on the left is Weld. It gets very tall, as you can see, judging by this normally sized person <laughs> standing by it. We'll talk about this later, but it's a biennial. So this is how it looks in its second year when you harvest it. You're gonna harvest that all. It will self-seed, so you can leave a few plants in there to self-seed, or you can just plant it again the next year. In the top right is Dyer's Chamomile, and the bottom right is Goldenrod. Red and orange I've kind of put together, although they are a little different. So the red comes from anthroquinones, and the oranges also come from flavonoids. The skein was dyed with matter root to get that true, lovely red matter root is what you need. There's some other dyes, again, that'll give you some versions of orange to red, but if you really want a true red, you need matter. You can get orange from certain kinds of marigolds, coreopsis, and onion skins give a beautiful orange color. So that's something that you've probably got in your kitchen right now. And those are yellow onions or yeah. red onions? Yes, yellow onions give you orange and red onions give you a green. Sometimes you don't know looking at the color of a plant what color it's going to give, what dye it's got hidden in there. So start saving your onion skins. You can mix them up. I do that and I just get some version of orange because usually I have more yellow onion skins than red ones. The big picture there is matter. I guess this is not the most lovely plant in your garden, 
as a matter of fact, the first year I planted it, my husband pulled up the entire crop because he assumed it was a weed. It looks very weedy. Its leaves are very sticky. It does get some very small flowers on it, but it's an amazing, amazing, amazing plant. It is the root that we use to dye with. And then we've got the onion skins there under that French marigolds, which are the best ones for dyeing. Although really any marigold will give you color. Okay, blue. Blue comes from the pigment called indigotin. We get that from the plant that we know as indigo. There's several species of indigo, and there's also something called woad. On the plant list, we've given you two good options for this area, Japanese indigo and Guatemalan indigo or fruticosa. They both do well in our area as annuals. If you lived a little bit south of here, you could grow it as a perennial, but not here in the mountains. Woad has the same pigment. It has the same indigo in it, but it's very invasive. And I know in places like Texas, it's against the law to plant it. So I don't recommend that you plant it. This was the plant that was used in Europe as a substitute before they started importing the more tropical indigo species. It's a biennial, but it reseeds itself. You have to pull it up before the plant sets flowers. So if you want to do that and you're very careful about pulling it up, you could try growing it. It grows very easily here, but we didn't include it on the plant list for that reason. It does have the same exact pigment as indigo. Here's some examples. On the left, this is a sufruticosa. On the bottom right, this is Japanese indigo. Indigo was planted as a cash crop in the 1700s in South Carolina. They had both sufruticosa and Japanese indigo. And evidently there is a wild indigo that grows called indigo carolinia. It was an inferior source of indigo. So they started importing both of these two types in South Carolina. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And the picture above that is the woad. This is what you don't want to let happen to your woad. This is in the <laughs> second year and it set flowers and it's going to be dropping its seeds and you'll have nothing but woad in your garden <laughs> the next year. I just want to make a comment because I have false indigo, which I've heard people say that you can use it. It's nothing to do with indigo. I don't know how it got that name, but it's not getting any dye from it. Okay, greens. You can't get this kind of very pure green or grass green from any plant. This was dyed with indigo and then over dyed with any of the flavonoids, so any yellow. You can do it the opposite way. You can dye it first with yellow and then indigo, but for more technical reasons, that's not the way to do it because it will strip off the mordant. But you need to combine those two colors, just like you would in painting to get the blue, yellow and green make blue. You can get various shades of green with dyeing with yellow and then doing an iron modifier that tends to turn things kind of a olive green or comfrey is one that gives you a nice olive green and that is on our plant list. And it's the leaves because the flowers are yellow. Yeah. Oh, and just a, a note, you would think all plants are green. Why can't we use the plants that are all growing outside full of chlorophyll. And if you were to put any plant in a blender, you're going to get this beautiful green colored liquid, but it will not dye anything because that green comes from chlorophyll and that will not dye any kind of fiber. It's 100% water soluble. So it's just going to wash out. You know, sometimes you can get a stain from grass, but that's different from it dyeing fiber. Okay. Brown, the pigment there is naphthoquinone. And the best source of that here is walnuts. Black walnuts are everywhere. And if you don't have a black walnut tree in your yard, you probably have a friend or neighbor that does that would be tickled pink for you to come over <laughs> and gather those walnuts from the ground before they start rotting away. It's an excellent dye plant, very color fast. You don't need to mourn. It's been used traditionally by the indigenous Americans here in our area and many other areas. So it's a wonderful dye plant. You can make ink out of it, all kinds of great things. So I'm sure you know what a black walnut tree looks like. I just want to point out the walnuts to the right when they start to get black because they oxidize as soon as they hit the ground. That is degrading the jugulin, the pigment that's in there that gives you that beautiful brown. So you don't want your walnuts to look like that. You want them to be green. You have to be vigilant and as soon as they fall to the ground, you want to pick them up. And what you can do is just pop them in the freezer for later use. 
then you have them all year long and they won't continue to break down and oxidize and get that black color. So we didn't want to suggest that you plan your garden around a black walnut tree, but we did want to just let you know that it is so prolific around here that if you are interested in a brown dye, a really beautiful brown dye, that this would be your option. The leaves, by the way, will give you yellow. So lots of information, any questions so far? We have one recently, when using comfrey for olive green, do you use the iron modifier? But you don't have to. Iron tends to what we call satin colors, so you'll get a darker color and it will tend more towards the green. Iron also makes any natural dye more light fast and color fast. In other words, the color stays on the fiber better. You have to be a little bit careful with iron and protein fibers because it can degrade the fiber. So if you take a class on naturally dyeing, then we go over what percentage of iron to use, how long to leave the fiber in there. But you'll still get an olive green from Comfrey. Okay, um, there was a question early on, can you grow these dye plants in pots? Some of them, yes. I wouldn't recommend something like Weld because it has a very long taproot. It's gonna be happier in the ground. But certainly marigolds, when you look at the plant list, some of these are considered herbs as well. I mean, marjoram, bronze fennel, St. John's wort, purple basil, any of those things can be grown in pots. So it's going to depend on the plant. Yeah, even indigo you could put in a pot. Okay, so planning your garden. Uh, again, so much to consider here, just like any garden. If you're just strictly planting for the specific dyes and you don't really care about how it looks, if you're not looking for that beautification thing, you can do just about anything. We already showed you the weld and the matter, I think, are the two plants that we think are very important, but they're probably two of the least attractive plants. So you can bury them if you don't like the way they look. I've kind of gotten used to the matter. I wasn't so keen on it at first. It's almost like Velcro, and it lays on the ground. It spreads out. It's just not very attractive. And the weld, you know, gets really big, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And again, some of these plants get really, really tall. So you'll want to plant around them. And I have a couple garden designs coming up that I just kind of put together to give you some ideas. In this picture right here, you can see there's some that are very tall and then you want to be able to get to them so that you can harvest. Some of these plants, if you look at your plant list, they want you to harvest quite a few times throughout the growing season. So you want to be able to get to these plants, not just assume you're going to put them in and let them go until the fall. We've given you some growing tips on the different plants. Some of them are okay in infertile soil. Some of them really like really fertile soil. One of the considerations for matter is that you should lime it every year because it likes that, that helps it. Does it affect the color or is it, it just the, the color? Yeah. Okay. So there's things that you need to think about. And again, you know, with the matter, you need to have a place for one year, two year, and three year, and then you kind of rotate. But other plants like the annuals, you can put your marigolds in, you can put your coreopsis. Well, my coreopsis self-seeds, <laughs> self -seeds, so I don't have to plant that ever again. So it just different habits of those plants you'll need to consider. I'm going to talk about garden design in a little bit, so I'm going to go through that. Spacing. Some of these take a lot of space, but you don't want to pack them in too closely. You want to give them what they need so that you can harvest what you need from them. So pay attention to the spacing in the handout that we gave you. Plant habit, again, there's matter. It just lays on the ground, but it spreads out. It needs space. If you're planting Hopi black sunflowers, really tall, they don't take up a lot of space on the ground, but their root system is pretty significant. It's almost like a tree. I don't think I had a hard time pulling mine out last year, in fact. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the life cycle. Is it an annual, perennial, biennial? You have to keep that all in mind. And then the ones that self-sow. I was just talking about the Coreopsis. I planted it one year, and it pops up every year in different places, but that's <laughs> kind of nice. It's a little surprise. I like volunteers in my garden, so I love stuff that self-sows. And then the yield. If you have a really good idea of how much you want to die and how much you need, then you're going to have to pay attention to the yield from each of these plants. Again, we've given that to you on the handout. I haven't gotten that far with any of my considerations. Whatever I have, I will harvest and save it. Joyce does a lot of dyeing, so she always has 
of something going on and I'm kind of like, oh, whenever I have enough, I'll get it. Mm -hmm. I'll get to it. Special care notes. We have those in there as well. They're going to be different for each plant. Sometimes they want you to harvest frequently. Sometimes it's once a year. So it's just going to depend. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, no. Okay. And then what to harvest. Sometimes it's the plants. Sometimes it's the leaves. Sometimes it's the flowers. Sometimes it's both. With matter, it's the root. So the Hopi black sunflowers, those are the seeds. So you'll need to pay attention to that as well. I'm just going to briefly talk about indigo, which is one of the traditional blue plants. It's in a category all its own, and I'm just going to turn it over to Joy <laughs> to talk about this. I love this picture. This is from my garden last year. And when the leaves are bruised, you can see the indigo in the plant is revealed. So you can see that amazing blue color. Indigo, as Pat said, is kind of in a class to itself because it has a pigment, which is different than a dye. And I won't go into all the chemistry of that, except to say that you can't directly dye with a pigment. You have to do something chemically to turn it into a dye. A lot of people get turned off by using indigo because of that, but there's a way to, to use it fresh that will turn your mind around to growing indigo because you can, as Pat said, get some beautiful colors and then you'll get into it and you'll want to learn how to ferment it and turn it into a vat. It's an annual, as I said, in our area. I grow the Japanese indigo. I haven't had quite as much luck with the Sufriticosa, but friends of mine that live close by have. So we're gonna do both kinds in our dye garden this year. So this is how you need to space them apart, about two feet apart. It's kind of like basil plants. The more you pinch them off, the bushier they get and the greater yield you get. So we say to do it, I think three times a year to harvest it, but really it's up to you depending on how your plant looks. So you need about two to four plants for 100 grams of fiber. So that's not too bad. They need to be in the sun and they are heavy feeders. They prefer uh, foliar fertilization, something like fish emulsion uh, yeah. every three weeks. For some ideas in case anybody was interested, kelp, compost tea, herbal tea, or fish emulsion. Yeah, and as I said, you can harvest it uh, about three times or even more, depending on how your plants are looking. So I know even somebody very recently said to me, oh, I don't grow indigo because you can't really use the leaves to, to die with. But first of all, you can use them fresh. And all you do is you pick the leaves, you zizz them up in a blender and you put them in zizz ice up. and then you dye your fiber and you get a beautiful teal color. You can even coax what's called Indi Rubin from the indigo plant, which is the red pigment in there and get a beautiful paint. The other thing I shied away from for a very long time was extracting the pigment, but it's really not that hard. I mean, you have to watch it a bit. You just put it in a tub of water and the indigo pigment will come out of the plant into the solution of water. Then you do a few things <laughs> and then you get the dried pigment. And then you get the same thing you would get if you ordered indigo online. You get this blue pigment, which you then make into a organic fat, but extracting the pigment is really not that hard. So I encourage you to grow indigo. And the one thing I will have to say, so last year I tried to grow indigo for the first time and we talk about the number of plants you need and how tall they get. Well, my plants only got to be about six inches tall. So there was not much leaf on it. So we're talking about healthy plants. When we talk about how many plants you need, we talk about good, healthy plants, not my sad little things from last year. <laughs> the pigments in the leaves. I do recommend saving seeds. I've had about an 85% germination rate with the seeds I saved from my garden last year. So it's worth saving because they're pricey to buy online. Okay, matter. And this, I just found out today, is a picture of one of Joyce's matter roots. I thought she had pulled it down off, off the internet, but it's so beautiful. For the plant being as unattractive as it is, when you pull up the roots, you can see the color right away. It's really beautiful. It is a perennial. So what Joyce has taught me is that I got one year going, and to get the second year going, if you just tack the plants down, they will root. And then you have to be able to determine your first year, second year, third year. I guess a good rule of thumb is if the roots are about the size of a pencil, then they're probably good for dying, but you should leave them two to three years. They need to be spread apart because it does lay down and spread out, probably roots itself, you probably don't even have to tack it down. You need only two plants 
It's very leafy and the leaves, like I said, are sticky. They're almost like Velcro. They have something on them that makes them really sticky. Likes alkaline soil. So if you apply lime yearly, it will like that. You harvest the roots when they're at least a pencil in diameter. You pull up the plant, remove the tops and dry the roots. So that's why you have the three year rotation because you have to pull the entire plant up. So you lose that plant on the third year. And weld. I started three weld plants last year and put them out in my garden. I don't have a formal garden. I just have an area where I'm putting some dye plants and only one survived, but it got absolutely huge. And now I have some babies this year, but I guess it's unattractive. I don't know. I grew to like it. It has a really neat growth pattern. And at one time I looked out and there had to have been six pairs of golden finches on my weld plant all at the same time. And there were some in the pine tree behind it waiting to take their turn. The gold finches just absolutely love this plant. So it's a biennial, two feet apart almost doesn't seem enough for me. I think my one was about five or six feet tall last year. Four plants for a hundred grams of fiber. And this is the leaf. The flower is not very significant. These are the little flowers right here. Yeah. And there, so harvest in the second year and seeds are prolific. It will self seed. If you just let the birds have at it and spread them around, you'll find the baby weld plants around. These are just some different ideas depending on the kind of the space you have. This is a five foot circular design. You would certainly want to put the taller plants that you want to grow in the center to be able to access the lower growing ones. So the garland chrysanthemum I had on either side, I think the uh, St. John's wort, which gets pretty tall over here. I put the yellow cosmos here in the center. Again, that gets pretty tall. And then the zinnias were over here next to the French marigolds. Those are all relatively short and the Dyer's Coreopsis down here. So just an idea if you have a relatively small space, if you're putting something back in the corner, you can take the circular design away and just fill in a corner, but you wanna make sure that you can access to harvest. There's a little bigger one. Now this is in a raised bed. You can see I put a lot of plants in here. And so probably you're not gonna get the yield to do a big project or anything, but I was thinking more about the look of this one as far as the attractiveness. I put the matter all along the back and I put these lines in here just to show you that there would be three years, one, two, three years, and then scattered some of the taller things down the center and then the shorter things along the outside. The other thing, and I pointed this out earlier, purple basil, marjoram, bronze fennel, those are all also herbs. I grew purple basil because I just love dark colored leaves and I tried to cook with it and it turned everything brown. So I don't cook with it anymore, but I still grow it because I love the look of the plant and it gets these beautiful pink flowers on it. I grow it in my vegetable garden just for the attractiveness of it. So there's a lot of plants in here. You can certainly do less even in this size space. This is 12 by five. There's no right or wrong way with these. Some of them are really beautiful. Just mix them up. Any questions? Actually, we've had quite a few. I want to back up a little bit. Somebody asked if there was another option for brown. Not that grows in our area. The other browns is a brown that comes from a tree that grows in Central America. So I don't know of any other brown. You can push things that are kind of yellow green with iron to get a much darker color. But for brown, for us, walnut would be the one. Okay, great. Have you tried using deoxidized indigo to make pure mid-gree? No, the only green I've gotten with indigo is using fresh indigo and you can get teal. I don't think you're gonna get green from any kind of indigo, whether it's well, if it's not reduced, it won't work as a dye. If it's reduced, it's definitely going to give you blue. There is that other pigment, indirubin, which is pink. But to get green, you have to over dye it or use it fresh. And then it's not really green, it's teal. I guess it depends on what you consider teal. It's somewhere between blue and green. Okay, great. Um, somebody asked you a question about soil preparation. Oh, well, hmm. a good 
the soil that you would do for anything you're planting. Some of the plants like matter and weld are really not fussy. Other ones like indigo, like a good rich soil, but I think your typical garden preparation for planting vegetables or any kind of flowers is fine. We haven't gotten the soil for our beds yet at the Learning Garden, but we're just getting a regular planting mix, nothing special, but you take into consideration you're going to add lime to the matter and mm -hmm. take the specific plants into consideration. But as far as the soil goes across the board, I think just normal, not garden soil, but planting soil. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Somebody asked, that they live in Burnsville at about 3,800 feet, and they're wondering if Persicaria tinctoria will grow there at a high elevation. Yeah. Yeah, your growing season is probably going to be shorter. Definitely wait till the last frost in your area and then maybe add a week or two because you know how crazy things are here in the mountains. So you may not be able to harvest three times. You may just get two harvests out of it. But yes, you can. Okay. And then there's a question here of bittersweet roots. Does that give an orange dye? You know, I don't know about that, but I don't think I would grow bittersweet. And I guess <laughs> if you're finding it and foraging with it, give it a try. I have not used it myself. And then we have one more. Hopi black sunflower, do you dry seeds or use them fresh? And do you grind them up to extract the dye? You can do either. And I have not ground them up. Anytime you grind something up, of course, you're going to increase the surface area ratio. So that's probably a good idea. You can either save them and use them dried or use them right away. If you grind them up, the color comes out of the hull. But when you grind them up, you're going to have the seed in there. Does yeah. that affect... Anything? I don't think so, okay. yeah. And then we did have one more. How do you get pink from indigo? Again, could you repeat that? Yeah, that's really a discussion for another day. You, okay. can, you can use the leaves fresh. You can actually extract the teal color first in an ice dye, and then you change the pH, you acidify that bath, and you heat it. Uh, and then you're going to actually destroy the blue pigment and what you're left with is the indirubin. Then you can get a second dye out of it. Okay, and I think that's it. Thank you. Saving seeds. So these are weld seeds. They're tiny. They're about the size of poppy seeds. Yeah, I was going to say that. Very, <laughs> It's definitely worth saving them for weld. They're a little bit hard to find to purchase and they'll be a little pricey and one plant will give you enough seeds for you and all your friends. Um, so, you know, definitely if you let one plant go to seed, you'll have tons of seeds. So what I do is I just harvest the plant and then hang it upside down as I would to dry the leaves and the flowers. And then I attempt to winnow <laughs> as best I can. <laughs> I just plant them with the chaff still on it. I mean, it's very hard to get that beautiful single seed by itself. Hey, we don't really they, need to. When they self-sow, they don't worry about right. getting it. <laughs> yeah, right. And the same is true with indigo. Definitely save those seeds because they are even pricier and harder to come by. And I think the ones that grow in my garden, the natural selection has happened and they're going to be okay in that space. So I'm pretty sure that those seeds will be good for me to replant again. Make sure you keep them in a cold, dry, dark place for next year, and do share them with your friends. Or if you want, you could start a little cottage business and sell them. <laughs> Not many people are selling seeds. Here's an example of weld being hung upside down. I put my weld up in my attic because it's very dry and hot and dark. But anywhere in your house or in your garage that you want to hang your plant material upside down. If it's something like this, that's what you're harvesting from the plant. If it's matter, you pull up the plant and it's only the roots. You want to rinse the roots several times and change the water because you don't want the dirt on it, obviously. There's some pigment on the outer part of the bark that's brown. So if you want to get that true red, the more you rinse it. And some people actually boil it once and throw that first water away because you're gonna get those brown pigments, which are more soluble in the water, get rid of those and then use the rest of it. And 
the matter root is one that the more you can chop it and grind it, the more diameter you're going to get out of it. So again, you want to keep the plant material dry if you're not using it fresh because it will mold. So whatever you need to do, hang it up or put it on screens. Don't forget to label your plant material. Ask me how I know. Once the plant material is dry, you're not really, hmm, what was that again? If you just have the leaves off the stalk, it may be hard to tell what that is. And then you can use that throughout the year. You don't have to use it fresh. All of these that we talked about, you can use dried. You can also freeze some of these things. Yeah. But there's some other things from looking here. The garland chrysanthemum, it says you can oh, okay. freeze that. Okay. Flowers. Certain things you can mm -hmm. freeze. This is a picture of <laughs> where we were as far as April 13th this year, but we're very excited about it. We've been trying to get the dye garden started for a few years. In the back, if you haven't been to our learning garden, well, let me give you a little history. When I first started as a master gardener here, we were in a building downtown on Cox Avenue, which is now the tax office. We were surrounded by concrete. That's all we had. It was great for people who needed a central location when we have our helpline and people would stop in and bring us samples and everything. It was very convenient. We ended up moving, I think about four years ago now, out to Mount Carmel Road in Leicester. We share the space with soil and water. But what we got with that move is this great blank slate of property. As gardeners, we all went kind of crazy. We have a beautiful design out there. We have so many different kinds of gardens. We were just really getting traction with being able to have demo days and everything. And of course, COVID hit, and I hate to keep repeating that. But what you can see in the back of this picture is the vegetable garden. We just put a nice fence up around it because we have a groundhog that lives on site and we haven't been able to get rid of him. The whole piece of property has different gardens. These are our two big beds. You can see they're not even filled with dirt yet. We're going to have five three by three beds that are constructed of metal. We have to get those placed. We're going to do that this week. So we're very excited. We have folks starting plants that we will have available to put in our beds in mid-May. I just wanted to let you know that we are planning out for some more programs. On June 7th, we are planning on having an intro to botanical dyeing. We did two of these last year to kind of get a check on the interest of having the dye garden and talking about dye plants. It was very successful. So we're excited to be able to offer that again. You'll get some more information about how to actually use the plants to make the dye bath and things about mordanting <coughs> and yeah, uh, modification, things it'll, like that. We'll still be talking about the plants, but we'll be talking a lot about how to use the plants to get these uh, natural dyes. <clears throat> on August 9th, we're planning on having some demos. September 20th, harvesting dye plants. We have no idea if any of these will be able to be in person. We would love to say yes, but right now have to plan virtually until we get the go to actually have things in person. The demos, we're just itching to have people out in the garden with us. You'll know more about that as we progress. Mm -hmm. These are resources I really recommend. You'll find a lot of, as we do with anything, information online, not all of it is accurate, but here's some information I can definitely recommend. Wild Color by Jenny Dean. She is writing from England. She has a couple of books, so some of the plants she refers to may not be ones that we can easily find here, but this is an excellent, excellent first book. She talks about both dye plants and technique for dyeing. Uh, the second one, once you get a little bit more experience, this is not a beginner book, but it's my Bible for dyeing. If you are really into the scientific chemical aspects of this, this is the one for you. <laughs> Catherine Ellis lives here in Waynesville. She's an internationally known natural dyer, so it's great that she's right here and she's such a good resource for us. This is not about the plants as much as the technique of natural dyeing. Everything and anything you'd ever want to know about natural dyeing is in this book. We've um, been to her garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, a dyer's garden, that's this little one. That's what we used for a lot of the information about how many plants you need, how tall the plants get and things like that. So this is also a great resource. And a little plug for a local nonprofit organization, 
Local Cloth. It's a fiber-based organization, but there are classes on natural dyeing, and we have a natural dye and indigo study group that meets once a month. Where can you get seeds and starts? Botanical Colors, they're in California. They have a wide variety of seeds. Strictly medicinal, you can get seeds and starts. Grand Prismatic Seed, I think, is just seeds. And then back to local cloth, we have a local grower that is out of Warren Wilson who sells both starts and seeds. Another seed purveyor is the Dogwood Dyer. We are hoping to have some starts if we are in the garden mm -hmm. on that June 7th date starts to give away and hopefully we'll have some starts to sell at the plant sale coming up. Too. We have a plant sale on, is it the 8th? Yeah. Uh, at the Red Cross building on Merriman Avenue, if you're local. We have several master gardeners who have started plants for us and we do have an abundance. So we're hoping to have some at the plant. So I can't tell you what's going to be there right now. We haven't figured that out. But we do have weld and indigo for sure. And as Joy said, we hope to have some that we would be able to give away if we can get into the garden face to face, but that's yet to be seen. Here's just a little more about our learning garden. As I said, we kind of got excited when we got out there. So we now have the dye garden. I put that first. There's a beautiful rose garden when you first enter the property. We have a veggie garden. They grow all kinds of cool stuff. Pollinator garden, a Four Seasons garden, gateway garden, sun and shade garden, and a compost area. We don't manage it, but the, there's a rain garden, a pretty beautiful, significant rain garden that is on site as well now too. There's a walking path and I mean, it's a great place to go. As I said, we're not doing anything face-to-face -face right now, but you are more than welcome to go out and walk around and see how our gardens develop. Everybody's out there weeding now in their specific gardens. There are work days where people are out there taking care of things, getting ready to plant things just like we are. You're more than welcome to come to the property and use the walking path and explore our gardens. You have to follow the guidelines, of course, but we welcome anybody who wants to come out and see it. We get excited in the springtime when things start to happen. And since we got closed down early last year, we're all missing that camaraderie of sharing our garden. So I invite anybody who is local to take a drive out there and enjoy. Any final questions? We didn't have any final questions. We had people wanting the location of the garden, 49 Mount Carmel Road, and you'll want to make sure you put road into your GPS if you're using that. Again, for future classes, the bunkummastergardener.org, the blog, and the events calendar will be posting upcoming classes. We really want to thank everybody who joined us today and appreciate your interest and participation. Lots of kudos to you, Pat and Joyce. So thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you in the garden.